Hey everybody, this is Matt Atkinson, and you're watching Four Gettysburg with Aaron Smith. How's it going everybody? Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Forward Gettysburg. As always, I'm your host, Aaron Smith. I am super excited about today's episode. I'm continuing that theme of taking a look at some of the older episodes and redoing and reworking some of them. And today we are expanding upon the Barlow's Knoll episode and we are talking about the 11th Corps entry to the Battle of Gettysburg. So thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate all the support for the channel. I appreciate everything you guys have been doing, subscribing, watching. You keep watching. I'm going to keep making great Gettysburg campaign and Gettysburg battlefield content. So here we are, July 1st. John Reynolds has been killed on the field. Oliver Otis Howard, Major General of the 11th Corps, is now in command of all forces at Gettysburg. He's going to bump his general shirts up to the 11th Corps command, and that's going to move General Schimmelfinging up to division command and move Von Amsburg up to brigade command. We see the shuffling of generals going on here on July 1st, trying to fill in these gaps that are created as they fall on the field. Now the 11th Corps, they're going to split up somewhere around the Moritz Tavern. Two divisions are gonna come up the Emmitsburg Road. Another division is gonna come up directly on the road behind me, which is the Tawny Town Road. Now these two corps are going to essentially meet where the Emmitsburg Road and the Tawny Town Road meet here, which is gonna be directly behind me at that stoplight. Obviously the stoplight was not there at the time of the war. General Howard, before any of his troops arrive, he's going to ride into town. He's going to get onto the roof of the Fawnstock House at the intersection of Middle and Baltimore Street. And he's going to see the unfolding fight that's just happening west of town. He is going to realize that the right flank of the Union Army is exposed. He's going to meet with General Schertz on Cemetery Hill, which is directly to my left. You could probably make out the National Cemetery directly behind me. They're going to meet there and they're actually going to receive a message from General Wadsworth who is on the field there west of town and Wadsworth is going to tell them in his report he is very concerned about the right flank of the Army of the Potomac. So they are going to devise a plan to send the 11th Corps through town to the north to fill in there on the Gettysburg Plain, which is a low kind of area of undulating farm fields that are just north of town along the Carlisle Pike. They're going to move the 11th Corps through town, through the streets along Washington Street, which is going to run directly behind me as the Tawny Town Road heads into town there. We're looking down at Washington Street. So in Wadsworth's report to General Howard, he is especially worried about the right flank. And he is going to include two conflicting ideas in his report. He is going to say that he thinks the army is retiring. And at that time, the Confederates were pulling back. Remember on day one, around 1130, 12 o'clock, we had a lull in the fighting there. So he thinks the Confederates are retiring from the field, but he's also worried about the enemy moving to his right flank. So Howard is going to order forward Schimmelfinning's division, formerly under Carl Schertz, and also Francis Barlow's division. Now there are three divisions in the 11th Corps. So what he's going to do with that other division that he's not moving through town to the north of town is he's going to post them on Cemetery Hill, an incredible piece of forethought by Oliver Otis Howard. That division is going to be von Steinwehr's. Now the thing about the 11th Corps that makes it unique is that the 11th Corps is comprised of mostly German and European immigrants. You have a lot of veterans of the 1848 revolution in Prussia that failed. A lot of these commanding generals for the 11th Corps, a lot of these brigade commanders, even some of your colonels, they are veterans of this 1848 Prussian revolution. So these men have some experience in combat. A nice little fun fact, if you guys have ever wondered why 
why are certain streets named certain things in Gettysburg? You know, Baltimore Street, that's explanatory, goes to Baltimore. Carlisle Street, that's pretty self-explanatory as well, goes to Carlisle. But when we think about Steinware, like that's just some random German name here. Steinware Avenue is obviously very clearly named after General von Steinwehr of the 11th Corps. So Barlow's division and Schimmelfinning's division, formerly Schertz's division, they're going to make their way north through town along Washington Street. So I'm currently headed north through town along Washington Street. And the, t the borough of Gettysburg at the time is going to have three main north to south, south to north thoroughfares through the town. Of course, we're going to have Washington Street here on the west side of town. We're going to have the Carlisle Pike, Baltimore Pike there right through the center of town. And then on the east side of town, there's going to be Stratton Street. All three of those roads Washington, Carlisle, and Stratton Street are going to see soldiers on them throughout the day. Union soldiers and then later on Confederate soldiers. So now we're currently on what's called the Gettysburg Plain. That's an area north of town. A lot of undulating farmland. There are two predominant features that overlook this area. We have Blocker's Knoll to the left of me, which is going to be to our east. And then we have Oak Hill standing like a sentinel overlooking the land over here to our west. So the 11th Corps, they're going to make their way through town. The first brigade to hit the field is going to be Von Amsberg's brigade. And Von Amsberg is going to set his troops up in a very, very thin line, connecting his left to the first corps right there on Oak Ridge. And he's going to stretch them all the way across the Mummusburg Road, which is this road running right behind me up to Oak Ridge. He's going to stretch them all the way over to the Carlisle Pike. It's going to be a very, very thin line. It's going to be the 45th New York, the 61st Ohio, the 74th PA, and the 68th New York from left to right. Behind them is going to be Dilger's Battery, posted on some slight high ground in their rear. And as soon as Dilger's Battery hits the field, they're going to come under fire from those Confederate guns up there on Oak Hill. As you can see, Oak Hill absolutely dominates this position. There is nothing that you can't see out here in the low ground from Oak Hill. So as soon as Dilger's battery gets into position, they're going to unleash a, a fire. The Confederate's gonna unleash fire upon them. However, Dilger is going to get his revenge. He is going to provide an incredibly accurate counterfire that is actually going to destroy five Confederate cannon carriages. Those Confederates are not gonna be able to salvage those cannons and they will have to leave five guns, five precious guns for a, um, a pseudo nation that is limited on supplies to leave five guns on the field is a huge, huge loss. So Dilger will get his revenge. Behind von Amsberg's brigade is going to be the brigade of Volodymyr Kurzyzanowski. I said it right. Mark that in the comments, guys. I said Kurzyzanowski correct. I'm going to say it right every single time. If I can say Wisconsin correctly, I can say Kurzyzanowski correctly. So Kurzyzanowski's brigade is going to take positions behind von Almsberg's brigade. Vladimir Kurzyzanowski is another one of these 1848 revolutionary veterans from Prussia. He's actually a Polish native and he is actually going to make his way out of Prussia and Poland, he's going to make his way to London and then emigrate over to America. They're going to reach the field after von Amsberg, but as Captain Alfred Lee of the 82nd Ohio will describe it, they were in solid square, deep formations that were especially vulnerable to artillery fire. So here we have Dilger's battery, Dilger's six Napoleons, drawing all this incredible artillery fire from Oak Hill. You can imagine six glowing brass guns glowing in the sunlight. That is an incredible target for these Confederate gunners. And now we add in the fact that there is an entire brigade that is lined up in squares. This is just too good. This is an artillerist's dream. Around this time, the 45th New York on the left flank of von Amsberg's brigade to the right 
of that first core line to the right of Baxter's Brigade. They are going to come under attack by O'Neill's initial attack on Oak Ridge. Of course, O'Neill's brigade is a part of Rhodes' division, which has just made its appearance up there on Oak Hill, and they are now beginning that attack. They are going to help repulse O'Neill's attack in tandem with Baxter's brigade. The 45th New York and Dilger's battery, they are going to bear the brunt of the attack here by the Confederates for Von Omsberg's brigade here. Next, we're going to have Wheeler's battery of four three-inch ordnance rifle take the field. And before they're even able to get into position, they're going to be blocked by fences and they're going to have to take the time to cut down these fences to clear a path for these three inch ordnance rifles to come through. Well, of course, you see enemy artillery delaying being stalled by this fence, you're going to fire upon them. And so now they are going to face an incredible artillery barrage from those Confederate cannons up on Oak Hill. And what's going to happen is they're going to be, uh, it's going to be a terrible, terrible barrage. In fact, Wheeler will see the barrage take off a man's leg and whirl through the air, landing on one of his caissons, and I quote, with a whack. Schimmelfinning's division has taken the field. Schurz's former command has taken the field. And next, we are going to have Barlow's division take the field here north of town at Gettysburg. Francis Barlow's division is going to take the field. Francis Barlow himself is going to be about 29 years old at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. He's a graduate of Harvard. Francis Barlow, truthfully, did not care for the 11th Corps. He wanted it to be known that his brigade, he was a brigade commander before the Battle of Gettysburg. He wanted it to be known that his brigade of the 11th Corps was not part of that terrible route from Jackson's flank attack at Chancellorsville. In fact, he's going to write to his mother after Chancellorsville saying that he had always been down on the Dutch. He's also going to add in a moment of honesty that some of the Yankee regiments have behaved poorly as well. He's going to observe as well in that letter to his mother that these Dutch won't fight. Their officers say so and they say so themselves and they ruin all with whom they come in contact. So here we are, north of town. Right behind me is the Gettysburg Ag Center, the Adams County Ag Center. At the time, that would have been the Adams County Almshouse. The almshouse was kind of one of these catch-all type of buildings for the ne'er-do-wells of Adams County. Um, your uh, chronically impoverished types, your chronically drunk, your lawbreakers, your um, people that, you know, had chronic illnesses. It was kind of a catch-all for all these types, the... Um, for lack of a better term, the dregs of society, the dregs of the county, they would all be at the almshouse. Barlow's initial position was supposed to be at that almshouse. He was supposed to spread his division from the almshouse and connect there with the Carlisle Pike. He would have connected with the right of Schimmelfinning's division. However, Barlow is going to spy a piece of ground that is just too good to give up. This slight rise of ground directly behind me was known as Blocker's Knoll at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. The Blocker Farm is just north and west in this direction, hence the name Blocker's Knoll. It is going to then go on to be known as Barlow's Knoll. Now very much like the Peach Orchard on day two, when Dan Sickles moves his third corps forward, Francis Barlow is going to spy this piece of ground, and he doesn't want the enemy to take control of it. He sees it as an incredible artillery platform, and rightfully so. It's a relatively high rise, relatively flat, perfect place to position some batteries. So Francis Barlow is going to ignore his original orders to take a position near the almshouse and he is going to move his two brigades under Leopold von Gilsa and Adelbert Ames. He is going to move them forward. Mind you, Barlow's division is not a very large division. 
Ames's brigade has about 1,300 men in it. Von Gilza's brigade has about 1,100 men in it. There are some regiments on the southern side. I'm thinking of the 26th North Carolina that had about 850 to 900 men. There are some regiments that are almost the size of some of these brigades under Barlow. So this is not a very large force of men. However, Barlow is going to move his men forward. He's going to send the 17th Connecticut forward as skirmishers. And the 17th Connecticut's task is to take the bridge over the Harrisburg Road and then to take the Joseph Benner Farm, which is a farm just north of the knoll, um, just north of where Rock Creek passes the Harrisburg Road. Ames's brigade is going to take a position on the left side of the knoll here. Von Gilsa's brigade is going to take a position on the right side of the knoll. And then right in the center, we will have Wilkinson's battery. Wilkinson's battery of six Napoleon cannons. Now, as the 17th Connecticut advances, to that position to take that bridge and the Joseph Benner farm, they're going to be kind of grumbling about it. They don't see any purpose in moving so far forward. However, just a mile to their north, Devon's cavalry, Devon's Union cavalry is being pushed back by a large Confederate force. So currently I'm on the crest of Barlow's Knoll. Rock Creek is going to be running directly behind me. Further off across the creek there along the Harrisburg Pike, which is running to my left, is going to be that Joseph Benner farm that I was talking about. While Barlow is moving into, into position, as he gets his troops into position, Dole's Georgians are just off in this direction. And they weren't really up to a whole lot just yet. However, after Barlow gets his two brigades in position on this hill, send his brigades forward to the banks of Rock Creek, essentially, Doles is going to spot the gap that Barlow has left by moving forward. He is going to spot the gap between his division's left flank and the right flank of Schimmelfenig's division. And Doles is going to make for that gap. So despite holding the high ground, Barlow has moved his division into a very, very poor position. Both of his flanks are essentially in the air. He's not connected to anything. He's not connected to any geographical feature to anchor his lines. He's not even connected to the right flank of the division of the organization of troops that is to his left. Not only that, but Barlow has essentially created a salient. And if we know about salience, a perfect example of a salient is that Spotsylvania Courthouse. If troops come on one side of that salient, this is our salient here. If troops come on one side of that salient, they can fire through and hit troops that are on the other side defending the opposite direction. So Barlow has essentially put himself in a terrible, terrible position here upon Blocker's Knoll. As this is all happening, as all these troop movements are occurring, as Doles is spying that gap between the two Union lines, Jubal Early's division of the Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia is slowly making his way down to this area. And Early is going to take a position on a high piece of ground just to the north of town. And he is going to watch this battle unfold here to the north. When Early realizes that his troops are approaching the flank of the Union line, he is going to order his four brigades, the brigades of Gordon, Avery, Hayes, and extra Billy Smith to the double quick to take advantage of this poor position the Union has found themselves in. As Barlow's division deploys and gets into position, Early's division is deploying to attack. Dole's Georgians are going to begin this attack and they're going to move to that gap in the line. And Kurzanowski's troops, which are still in squares, 
somewhere behind Von Amsberg's brigade, they are going to spy that gap and Carl Schurz is going to move them forward to fill in that gap. As that's going on, Early has deployed his artillery and he sees Wilkinson's battery up here on the hill and it's going to make a perfect, perfect tempting target and he is going to unleash artillery fire upon Wilkinson's six Napoleon guns. Hearing the artillery fire increase upon his right flank, Carl Schurz is going to climb to the top of the Hagee House, a house that was on the Mummisburg Road just outside of town, and he's going to see the Union right flank is in trouble. He is going to see Early's division start to weasel its way around the Union right flank. The 153rd Pennsylvania the 54th New York and the 25th Ohio, they are going to move forward to Rock Creek to check Gordon's Georgian as Von Gilza's brigade begins to engage Gordon's Georgians along the banks and the shores of Rock Creek. Doles has begun his attack on Ames's left as the left side of the salient is being attacked, as the right side of the salient is being attacked, Hayes and his Louisiana Tigers are going to start to make their way through the fields to the east of this position and start to envelop that Union right flank. As Hayes is positioning his Tigers, these tough fighting men from Louisiana, Gordon is going to smash through the Union defenders along Rock Creek. Gordon is going to smash Von Gilza's brigade on the right side of this salient and send them running. Doles is going to do the same to Adelbert Ames's brigade and he's going to smash them and they're going to fall back. Before they skedaddle through town, they're going to find a position somewhere near the almshouse to try to regroup and reorganize. Both Von Gilsa and Ames, they're trying to rally their troops. And while they're trying to rally their troops, they have left Kurza Zanowski by himself as the only organized brigade in this area. Kurza Zanowski, remember, he came forward to try to fill in that gap. So he is now on what would have been Barlow's left flank. Kurza Zanowski, one of his regiments, the 157th New York, he is actually going to be on Doles' right flank, and they're going to make a daring move to attack the right flank of Doles to try to stem the tide of Georgians coming their way. The 157th is going to make their way around that right flank, and they're going to hit the 21st Georgia. And so far, this sneaky little move by Kurza Zanowski is working out all right, but unseen to them. The 21st Georgia, hidden by farm fields, hidden by the undulation of the land, is going to hit the 157th New York in their left flank and deliver a terrible, terrible withering volley to the flanks of that New York regiment. In fact, it's so terrible that the 157th is going to suffer 75% casualties. Kurza Zanowski's brigade is going to make a valiant stand here north of town. Particular regiment of note is going to be the 26th Wisconsin. They're going to put up an incredible stand on the right flank of Kurza Zanowski's line. However, it is not going to be enough. They are going to find themselves quickly surrounded by these two brigades of Georgians. During the fighting here, Francis Barlow is going to be wounded, and the story goes that he's found underneath a tree, dying from his wound by General John B. Gordon, the leader of these tough veteran Georgians. And Gordon is going to order some of his orderlies to take Francis Barlow to a house in town, and, and they're going to deem his wound mortal. And they're going to leave Francis Barlow to die. However, Francis Barlow is not going to die at Gettysburg. In fact, he's going to become one of the most decorated and celebrated generals of the American Civil War. He is going to show incredible bravery 
for the rest of the war, especially at Spotsylvania Courthouse, when one of his divisions, with him now being a divisional commander in the Second Corps, probably the premier corps of the Army of the Potomac at that time, he is going to lead that fateful attack on May 12th in the morning. His division with the rest of the Second Corps, 20,000 men all together, are going to attack the salient known as the Mule Shoe at Spotsylvania Courthouse. And it's going to be the longest sustained fighting of the Civil War. It's going to be rainy. It's going to be very terrible muddy weather. Their guns aren't going to fire. The powder is wet. The charges aren't going to go off. So for 22 hours, these men are going to fight hand to hand, using muskets, bayonets, anything they can grab their muddy hands on to kill their fellow American. Wilkerson, unlike Barlow, will be mortally wounded and will die here at Gettysburg. And his father is a reporter who is going to cover the Battle of Gettysburg. And it's said that his father finds his son's dying body here upon the field. I can only imagine how heart-wrenching, how terrible, how sad, how angry that man must have felt finding his son here upon the field at Gettysburg. Meanwhile, Hayes is still headed toward town. And to the left of Hayes is going to be Avery's Tar Heels, Avery's North Carolinians, and they too are making a beeline for Gettysburg. The 11th Corps' position here on Barlow's Knoll, north of town, has become untenable. The men attempted to rally at the almshouse, but it's not going to be enough. And here we have the reputation of the 11th Corps in view for all to see. That reputation of the 11th Corps as the Flying Dutchman. Now, as you remember, I said over 50% of the 11th Corps are going to be emigrants from Europe. And I've actually had a discussion with quite a few people that are much more educated than myself. And they brought up a great, great point that these men are immigrants. If you offer them a steady job as a soldier, if you offer them citizenship in this country, they're going to take you up on that. That sounds pretty sweet. However, they don't really have any skin in the fight. They just came here from Europe. They haven't laid their roots down yet. They don't have any skin in the fight. So when it comes time to put up or shut up, to make a stand or to run and live another day, that choice is an obvious choice as well. They're going to run, they're going to skedaddle, and now we have history repeating itself all over again. The 11th Corps crushed and retreating. Seeing the Confederates driving the 11th Corps back through town, Schertz is going to order forward a small brigade of von Steinwehr's division, Coster's brigade. And they're going to make a valiant stand in town. So you guys want to talk about off the beaten path. I'm here on Coster Avenue. This is an avenue of the Gettysburg National Military Park that is actually surrounded by residential area. So I'm not trying to disturb those who are living nearby, but an integral part of the story of the 11th Corps is going to include Coster's Brigade. And of course, like we said earlier, they're going to be moved forward by shirts initially to support the right flank of Barlow's division. But then once Barlow's division falls and starts to fall back through town, they're going to be asked to cover the retreat. This is an awesome, awesome area, guys. If you ever get the chance to come out here again, please be respectful of all those who are living nearby. But you know, this is a really awesome place. There's a gorgeous mural right behind me, some really, really cool monuments as well. So Coster's Brigade is going to take up position here. And at the time of the battle, this is going to be a brickyard. None of this residential area is going to be here. Coster realizes that he now has to stall the oncoming 
rebels. And not only do we have Hayes' Louisianans, but his more immediate threat is going to be Avery's North Carolinians. So as they march north through town, the 73rd Pennsylvania is actually going to be stalled at the railroad depot there in town. And it's not really listed why they're stalled, but they're going to be stalled there at the railroad depot, perhaps to defend the railroad depot from the oncoming Confederates. So now Coster's brigade is only going to have three regiments. He's going to have the 27th Pennsylvania on his left flank. He's going to have the 154th New York in the center. And then off to his right, refusing the line is going to be the 134th New York. And there's going to be a gap of about, uh, you know, a sizable gap in between the regiments of the 154th New York and the 134th New York. So he, they're going to take about 50 men from that 154th New York regiment and try to fill in that gap. Now, as they're in this brickyard, taking cover behind some fences, they're unable to truly see what's in front of them until it's too late. And Avery's Tar Heels, they're going to be on coming and they're going to be met with a federal volley, but it's not going to be enough. This Union line is going to become incredibly untenable. They're going to be swarmed with the North Carolinians. Coster is going to order a retreat. But in the, in the confusion and the smoke of that battlefield, that fog of war, only the 27th Pennsylvania is going to receive that order. And the 27th Pennsylvania is going to fall back, leaving only the 154th New York and the 134th New York. Those New York regiments, they're going to take incredibly heavy casualties in this fighting. The 134th, they're going to lose about 60% of their regiment. The 154th New York, they're going to lose upwards of 80%. So it just goes to show you the numbers don't lie. These men are absolutely swarmed and surrounded, but their, their mission, their order is going to be fulfilled. They are going to help to stall these oncoming Confederates. Meanwhile, the Union is going to post cannon on Carlisle Street, and they're going to shoot canister into the oncoming um, Louisiana Tigers of Hayes' Brigade. But again, it's not going to be enough, and they're going to have to withdraw those cannons. And soon the rebels are swarming through the north of town. The 11th Corps and eventually the rest of the 1st Corps, they're going to fall back through town and regroup there on Cemetery Hill. Cemetery Hill being the place that Schertz and Howard had the forethought to put a division and now it turns out to be one lonely brigade on that hill as a fallback position. The Union Army is going to fall back on Cemetery Hill and overnight as more core of the Army of the Potomac come forward to Gettysburg, they're going to extend their line around Culp's Hill, and then to the south along Cemetery Ridge. Overall, the first day is going to be an incredibly tragic day for the Union Army. Of approximately 20,000 men to take the field for the Army of the Potomac on July 1st, 1863, the 1st and the 11th Corps, nearly half will be casualties. The 11th Corps will lose approximately 35% of its strength, with most of those being captured. Well, thank you guys so, so much for joining me on this episode of Forward Gettysburg. I hope you learned a lot. I hope it was informative. I know I had a lot of fun filming this, and I always learn a lot doing these things with you guys. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. As always, I'm your host, Aaron Smith, and I will catch you on the next one.